Oh, I'm Frank. Frank Hall. Twist it. Uh, yeah. yeah. Or just rock it back and around and around. Rock it. And there we pull go. There you go. Pull it up. We are planting are camas, which is a starchy bulb that was the traditional food source for the Kalapuya on whose lands we are. Their land stretched through the whole Willamette Valley south to Roseburg. And the whole, the the whole is from the Lakota to the Catapulu. Beautiful. Beautiful. All right. And, and now what we do is we, we stomp it. And I will, oh. I will stomp. Or if you want to stomp. No, you stomp because I'm not very stable. There you go. And, and, and that covers the bulb. And that bulb will grow and seed. And there's, there's 2,000 bulbs that we're planting here. We want to make this help be a sea of blue. That's like 2001 right there. <laughs> we have to come out here when that's full blue. <laughs> Please do. Please do. We will. We're, we're aiming for a square foot per bulb. Yeah. So you, you, did, you did excellent. Thank you. The people planted the bulbs for the color. And we're way over there. Well, you know, you are all related. And I'm Cherokee. So I'm related to you distantly, too. Yeah, you're sitting over on the east side of the country. I used to be. Yeah, but I've lived most of my life on Kalapuya land, and so I've adopted basically Kalapuya and Northwest tribes. Yeah. Join the clan. Just join them. Help them. Honor them. Well, this is so great. So, Thank you, guys. This was wonderful. I'm glad we so, met you. <laughs> me too. If you don't mind, I'll put this on YouTube. <laughs> Go ahead. I don't think he's really planting them for the Kalapuya. He's just doing it as a like a memory. Like, yes. Oh, we're, they're we're, not going to come out and harvest it. No. Well, you know, um, that's not in our plans, but the Kalapuya, the, as, as you well know, uh, the tribes got scooped up and like dumped like trash in the worst lands, right? Okay, to, to, to put it mildly, um, I mean, my ancestors were on the Trail of Tears and they would leave them behind to freeze in the in the frozen ditch. Oklahoma. Yeah, it's on the way to Oklahoma. It just, it, I, uh, uh, but um, so they don't have very good lands for growing the native foods, and um, they are interested in partnerships with the public lands, private lands, uh, and of course, obviously, in the reservation lands to uh, plant native foods enough that they can be sustainably harvested and actually become a, a, a first foods source. The Lakota people said they find the worst piece of land in wherever they can, and they put two things there, a military base and an Indian reservation. <laughs> if they find anything, the Indians are gone. <laughs> yeah, because it's just like... If they find oil. If they yeah. find oil, if they gone, find gold, gone. if they... I mean, we'll find another dump someplace. Yes. Put them there. In the 1849 gold rush, you know, um, I, I I went back uh, a few years ago to uh, in, in October and like celebrating uh, Indian uh, month. Giving their land back. Yeah, uh, it was the first time that that tribe had had a bear dance on this place where there had been a village, but when the gold was discovered. The whites came with guns and just basically slaughtered and just totally removed them, live or, or dead. They were just whatever, they were gone. And this the tribe was, I think they were Yura, they were so happy to have a bear dance there in celebration and, and sort of reclaiming that. Um, so much was done to the, these tribes because they had, they were worth the gold that we want, or the oil that we want, or the farmland that we want. Yeah. Well, that was carried on from the East Coast clear to the West Coast. You're right. It was manifest destiny. <laughs> we were manifest always in the way. <laughs> we were always in the way on our own land. We were always in the way. Yeah, how, how, did, how did we become in the way on our own land? It's like, wait a minute, I'm in the way of what? But, you know? Back in the 1800s, they put out a paper that said, free Indian land, you know? Right there, they told them it was Indian land. 
Really? It was free. It wasn't free, they, but they, well, it was free. But they, they actually admitted that was Indian land, but it didn't make any difference. It was still free to the white people. You know, I, uh, I've been part of a Salish culture sharing group uh, that, uh, meeting in a medicine house up uh, in the Swinomish Reservation up in northern Washington. And one night after ceremony, uh, everybody was like either camping out behind or asleep in sleeping bags in the medicine house. And some of us were sitting by the wood stove. Uh, it was just a bunch of guys. And I got the guts to ask a question that I had been wanting to ask, which was, why is it that I would just see that, that the uh, native tribes are to my sense complacent? Because here, you know, white culture came in and destroyed uh, the natives land land and the culture and then now this dominant culture is destroying the entire planet you know, how can you be like complacent in this you know and and then this woman's voice spoke up out of the dark corner I didn't realize there was an elder woman sitting there and she said, you have to understand the teaching. Whoa, what teaching? And she said something that I've meditated on ever since. She said, what needs to happen will happen. Hmm. And, and I realized if I think the climate change is destroying the, the planet, I need to fight. That needs to happen. And I may choose my battle to get something past or whatever. I might lose that battle. And if so, that needs to happen. But that may set something in motion. You know, and it may wake some people up. And you don't, you don't have to worry about winning every time. Just do what needs to be done. That needs to happen. But it also means if we don't get our act together and humanity goes extinct, that needs to happen. I mean, it's this, it's this really, you know, either if you show up, step up kind of a statement that... Well, the elders having a very difficult time teaching the young ones the red road because all this modern stuff is too easy. You know, they just not interested in what happened then or now. It's too easy to get them off onto the black road where they are now. Mm, the black road? Yeah. That's Ooh, well, I haven't heard black that. Black road. That's what we're on now. Ooh. I mean, Ooh. the young people are because they don't pick up the culture and they, they don't listen to the elders anymore. And there's not many elders left anymore. They, Oh. Sure, you know, um, you know, I, no, no one in my family speaks Cherokee. It's, it's been so long lost, but at least we retain the memory of that grandmother uh, and honor her. Um, but I, I also think that we have always adapted. We've always adapted. When we came across the land bridge, we discovered all this huge continent, um, we adapted. We're different than what was back there in Siberia. We, and and it, we have to keep adapting. And maybe we don't need the old language to communicate to our, our, ourselves today. But we also now are surrounded by other cultures that also are looking for acceptance and, and a place. We have to jointly find our place together and to, to come together as opposed to be divided and at war. And we have to come together. And that makes it, uh, everybody needs to be adapting. But, you know? Well, good luck on that. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. How do, we, how do we do that and honor these I traditions? Know. I don't think you're seeing all of the young kids that are actually are, you know. No, I don't, because I don't get out. Yeah. I don't go to the reservations them. or anything, and 
I've been getting him on YouTube. He's been watching a lot of Indian um, TED Talks and stuff, and they're Wonderful. talking about things. So. Wonderful. Well, that was interesting. There was a couple of elders that were really interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think it's it's so great that you guys could stop and do this. I'm so glad we, we met you. Uh, yeah. You know, speaking of the land bridge. Uh, it's the Lakota way. It's, uh huh. <laughs> right. To, to neighbor, to, to honor, to welcome. Um, the, the, the land bridge, when we were coming across the land bridge, we didn't know we were coming to a new continent. You know, we were coming in canoes along the coast, right? And it wasn't like, oh, let's go dis discover America. It was just like, oh, well, maybe if we go around that, that little cove over there, maybe there'll be some better fishing and some better hunting, and maybe we'll have a little hunting and fishing village, a, a seasonal ground over there. And pretty soon, maybe somebody sets up uh, homes over there, and, and it becomes a little village. And we just kind of gradually, over centuries, thousands of years, kept coming around. But we couldn't get inland because of all this ice. Every every valley we came to, the river pretty soon was blocked by ice. We couldn't get inland until we hit the Columbia. And here was this free-flowing river full of salmon. Whoa! And you could go inland in the Willamette Valley with mastodons. There were mastodons at the time. And elk and all this stuff. And the Deschutes River, they could keep it up into the Great Basin of Oregon. And there were huge lakes teeming with fish and it was just like whoa so the columbia was the gateway for humans into north america we live right here pretty cool stuff what was your name oh i'm frank frank hall nice <laughs> thank you frank thank you so much. all right you guys yeah. nice to meet you it's an honor to speak to you to you too sir or listen to you i should say <laughs> i gab a lot <laughs> no it's great well you're you're easy to listen to. It's Great nice. storyteller. No one knows unless you tell them about it. I know. I know. You know, that's what the elders try to tell the young people, and they, they're not that in mm. Yeah. Well, good. I'm just glad that we were able to have a conversation. All right. Okay, well, we'll...